Hello, geometry students. This is Ms. Skoken, and we are back in Chapter 4, which is all about triangle congruence, and this time we're in Section 4-4, talking about congruent triangles. Our objectives are use properties of congruent triangles and prove triangles congruent by using the definition of congruence. Vocabulary, corresponding angles, corresponding sides, and congruent polygons. And we are going to, as always, get started with a warm-up. Question 1 says, name all sides and angles of triangle FGH. And as most things in geometry, we're going to draw a triangle FGH so we can look at it and we can see what's going on. Now that we've got a triangle to look at, we're going to name all of the sides using proper notation of this triangle FGH. We can see that the first one is segment FG. Just a reminder that we distinguish between lines, rays, and segments by the symbol above the two points that that thing, that geometric uh, thing goes through. And in this case, segment FG has the segment sign over it. The next segment that makes up a side of this triangle is segment GH. And of course, the last one is segment HF. Again, another reminder, segment FG and segment GF are the same segment. Next, we're going to list the angles on this triangle. And they are angle F, which we can also call angle, in fact, let's do that. Let's call angle F angle HFG. Because remember, we do often need, when there's more than, than just one triangle or one object in our diagram, Sometimes points are involved in more than one angle, and so we need to be able to name our angles using three points. So HFG, and again, a reminder, the letter in the middle is indicating the vertex to you. So our next angle can be called angle FGH, and... This time, angle G is the indicated vertex. Our last angle would be angle G, H, F. And once again, H this time is the letter in the middle. So that's indicating the vertex to us of the triangle. So we've got our three sides and three angles of a triangle. Question number two says, what is true about angle K and angle L? And explain why. So we notice we have two different triangles, triangle IJK and triangle NML, and we see arc marks. In angle 1 and angle N, we have one arc mark. In angle J and angle M, we have two arc marks. And we remember, because of the third angle theorem, that that means that angle K and angle L have to be congruent to one another. That leads right into question three, which says, what does it mean for two segments to be congruent? And if two segments are congruent, we might say it in a lot of different ways, but basically it means that they are the same length. And that leads us right into the next question, which says, what makes two geometric figures congruent? Now, all of these questions in the warm up have really been leading us towards this idea of geometric or congruent geometric figures. And so, as we reflect on the questions that we've just answered, we realize that in order for two geometric figures to be congruent, they need to have congruent corresponding angles and congruent corresponding sides. It wasn't very long ago that we learned about dilations, and of course dilations are transformations where we have two geometric figures that have the same angle measurement, so they have the same shape, but they have different size, sizes. So that dilation uh, in, introduces two different geometric figures that are not congruent, but they are what we call similar. So we'll learn more about that in the future coming up, but for right now, we're going to say that in order for two geometric figures to be congruent, we need to have congruent corresponding angles and congruent corresponding sides. In the box, we can see that there are properties of congruent polygons, and it's basically what we were just talking about. 
congruent corresponding angles, congruent corresponding sides. One thing that we need to really make a note of is that when we are naming a polygon, we need to write the vertices, we need to write the name of the polygon in order. And so what that means is with our rectangle PQRS, we can name it in order of the vertices how they appear consecutively. We cannot zigzag around the figure and name, for instance, the polygon PRSQ. That doesn't work. We do have to use consecutive. We can go in either direction depending on what the orientation is. So, but it does need to be consecutive order as we go around the outside of the figure. The other thing that is important for us to mention is, and this is kind of a prelude to example number one, one of the things that we need to do is be very conscious of the order in the name of the figure. And for example, in, ex in our example number one, where we're naming corresponding parts, we can see that the triangle PQR is congruent to triangle STW. And I just want to draw your attention. That means that we're gonna have a segment PQ. That segment PQ is gonna to correspond to segment ST. First two letters with the first two letters. We can see this directly in the name of the geometric figure. So let's go ahead and get started on example one. And we're gonna start out by drawing triangles because of course that always makes it easy for us to figure out what's going on in this situation. So let's start with drawing triangles. Our triangles don't necessarily need to be in the same orientation, but for right now, we have put them in the same orientation. It's just a little bit easier for us to look at. So let's get started naming the sides that are corresponding and congruent in our two congruent triangles. The first one, of course, we already mentioned, and that is segment PQ is congruent to segment ST. Then as we go around the triangle, segment QR is congruent to segment TW, and segment RP is congruent to segment WS. Now let's list all of the angles that are congruent. In this particular diagram, we have a choice because we don't have any conflicting triangles or other angles, so we can name each one of these angles with a single letter this time around. So angle P is congruent to angle S, angle Q is congruent and corresponding to angle T, and angle R is congruent and corresponding to angle W. All right, let's move on to the now you try. You have an opportunity to work on this one and turn the video back on when you have completed your question. Whether or not you drew the figures, you could have just used the names. Hopefully you were able to come up with the angle names and the segment names without any difficulty. If you do have some questions, of course, bring them up in class. Let's take a look now at example two, using corresponding parts of congruent triangles. We've got a diagram and we also have the information that triangle ABC is congruent to triangle DBC and Remember, order matters in the names, so that means that angle A and angle D correspond to one another. So because these two triangles are congruent, and we can see that both of them are right triangles, there are a couple things that we can write down that we know. For one, angle BCD is congruent to angle BCA. That means that the measure of angle BCD is equal to the measure of angle BCA. Now it just so happens we have the information that angle BCD is a right angle, so that means it's equal to 90 degrees, and the measure of angle BCA has an algebraic expression, 2x minus 16. Well now we've got an equation, once we substitute in and we can solve this equation, we add 16 to both sides and we end up with 106 is equal to 2x, and that means that x is equal to 53. And that was the first part of what we needed to find. Just a reminder, that is not 53 degrees because it's not an angle measurement. It's just a value of variable in the expression 
for the measure of angle ABC or BCA. Okay, so now we want to find the measure of angle DBC. And we know that the two triangles are congruent, and we know that we have right triangles, and we have a measurement for angle A, which of course corresponds to angle D. So angle D measures 49.3 degrees, and we also know that the acute angles of a right triangle are complementary. Complementary means that they add up to 90 degrees, so then we can say that the measure of angle DBC is going to be equal to 90 minus the measure of angle CDB. And we know that the measure of angle CDB is equal to the measure of angle CAB, as we just said, because they're complementary, or I'm sorry, congruent triangles. So we can plug right in for the measure of angle CDB, which is 49.3, and that means the measure of angle DBC is 40.7 degrees. Just a reminder, this is a geometry class. We do care about notation and we do care about vocabulary, so be conscious of that. That brings us to an opportunity for you to practice this new skill. So you're going to work on the Now You Try and turn the video back on when you're done so you can check your answer. As always, if you have any questions on this example, remember to bring them up in class, but hopefully you were able to show that you have a good understanding of how to use these corresponding parts of congruent triangles. Okay, that's it for lesson 4-4. Time for you to get started on your homework, and I'll see you back in class.